All right, let's have a, a look. Uh, everyone has these things at home. Is this resource constrained? It's a PC. <sighs> yeah, it's got, you know, eight to 16 cores, four to six gig clock, 64 gig of RAM, and I don't know how many terabytes of storage. Is this resource constrained? Uh-uh. You can run whatever you want on there. So straight out. Thinking a bit too big. Ah, everyone's got one of these things. They're little. Well, those specs are actually from my phone. Your phone may differ, but it's still got eight cores. It's a 64-bit architecture, uh, three and a bit gigahertz, 12 gig of RAM on a phone, and half a terabyte of storage. Not resource constrained. Still thinking too big. <laughs> now we're getting better. Raspberry Pi. Everyone here probably has a Raspberry Pi. Hands up if you don't have a Raspberry Pi. Good. Oh, oh, there are two. Damn. Anyway, is this resource constrained? Well, it's a quad core 64-bit, one and a half gig clock. We're getting the right direction. Uh, it can have between two and eight gig of RAM. And I checked the specs. It'll support a two terabyte MMC card. You can run a full-blown Ubuntu in a container on one of these things. It's not resource constrained. Further down, let's think. Well, most people here actually do have a device that you could call resource constrained. It's what connects you to the internet at home. It's one of those sort of, not that exact one necessarily, but it's those sort of things, a network router. So it has the ability to talk to a modem or a cable coming in. It gives you Wi-Fi. It maybe has one or two ethernet ports and it runs on a tiny processor. That processor is smaller than what's in my watch. So it's a single core, 32-bit, running at 792 meg. It's got 256 meg of RAM. It's got 256 meg of flash. When was the last time you went to the shops and bought a 256 megabyte USB stick? Can't do it. So it looks a bit like that. There's another one sat there actually plugged in. But that's the sort of thing it is. So you can plug in antennas, plug in your SIM card, get access to the network. Nice and simple. Does one thing, does it well. Why would you use a resource constrained device? Well, these little things normally run from flash. They also normally run an operating system which is in read-only storage. To, the, the only way to get enough storage is to normally compress the image, which by definition means it's pretty much read-only. Um, they can also be encrypted for security, so if someone steals your device, they can't sort of log into it and find out uh, all your secret passwords and things. It's got a small footprint. I mean, there are devices smaller than this, but that's, that's still pretty small. And it's reliable. Because you can't really add things, you know, there's no dependency hell the way you get in your home PC, your home operating system. What you get is what you get. They're also inexpensive. You can use, you saw the, the power of the CPU. There's no other device that uses that. It's, it won't support a graphical user interface. Yeah, it's, it's too slow. Um, it's also optimised for the task at hand. What does it do? It pushes packets around. That's all it does. That's what it's, it's designed to do. One advantage is, though, if you can't change the file system, neither can that guy. I don't know why hackers are always sort of have hoodies and stuff. I mean, just used, I mean, it should just really be pizza and Coke just sat on your desk and, yeah. All right, now, the next one we'll go over very quickly because hopefully I don't have to explain this to anyone here. What are containers? Well, first things, what are they not? They're not virtual machines. And they're not virtual machines. I said it twice because it, it's really a very important point. They're not virtual machines. Thank you, Red Dwarf. So what is a container? Basically, it's a way of separating processes from what we call the host operating system. So you can, pl you can run a process in a protected space so that it will not interfere with the host. 
normally that gives you extra security. It means that if, if you crash inside your container, you don't crash the entire system. They usually run as unprivileged users, so even if you do f somehow manage to get out, you can't do anything. The low operating system is locked out against you because you've got no rights. Um, you can give containers access to hardware, to peripherals, to directories, things like that. So you can interact with the hardware on the device. Um, the other important one, and again, probably don't have to tell you all, it runs under the same kernel as the host operating system. So it's really just separating the processes. Now, a few years ago, before containers were a word, that's what we used to do. It's basically a new root directory and hey, we'll put a few permissions to stop people doing silly things. Okay, so we know what containers are, we know what resource constrained devices are. Why on earth would you run a container on such a tiny device? Well, for exactly the reason that you can't modify the operating system. It's in read-only flash. What happens if you want to just add this little extra function? Hey, we didn't give you Java, we didn't give you Python, we didn't give you this. I'd, re I'd really like to be able to run that on the device. Well, you can if you use containers, because that's separate to the host operating system. It can also mean you can run your own applications. So it removes the need for having a different device. I can't name the customer. However, we do have a customer who is actually, who, who managed to remove an entire device from their setup. They control traffic signals and they used to have to talk to the traffic light via a box that then went to a network that went out. And so what we did was, uh, when we talked to them, they said, oh, we have to run our special application because it talks us an encrypted protocol. I said, oh, well, you can run it on here. No, you can't. Yeah, you can. And that's what they're doing now. So they actually save themselves money by taking out a device and running everything in a container and running their own code. All right, a bit of a tricky thing. Living on the edge, it's a trendy thing to say. But what it does mean is you can run some basic, even on something that size, you can run basic <coughs> edge uh, programs. I mean, you can run a, a very small web server if you want. One that's actually quite useful is a custom IDS IPS solution. Hopefully everyone knows uh, intrusion detection. Um, and what you can do is, because these things are a router, you can take the packets straight into the container, run your custom solution, and then push them back out again. So it means you don't have to modify the operating system on the device. And you still get protection from uh, basically unwanted packets. And again, we've gone through it again, security, it's separated from the host system, it's unlikely. Now, I, I won't say it can't, because as soon as I say it can't, someone says, well, you know, I had a case. So it's unlikely to compromise device security. What resources on our resource-constrained device are actually required to run a container? Well, pretty obvious, storage, RAM and CPU. That's pretty much all you've got anyway. So what, in terms of storage, you've got to store the utilities to make the container run in your flash image. Pretty obvious, yep. Starting and stopping, managing. You also need libraries because the utilities normally uh, include a library. The other one is the container file system. You actually have to store your container on the device. So you need enough space to actually fit the container. In terms of RAM, basically you need enough RAM to run all the processes you want. So that one's, you have, haven't really got much control other than what processes you can physically run. And the CPU, again, you're sharing, especially on that little one, a single CPU. If you can physically run it on the device, well, it runs. So. How do you run containers? Well, I'll, I'll go through a couple. There, there are two very well known, um, and both of them are really good. We'll first of all start with Docker. Now, I actually use Docker. We use Docker for our build environments. It's not exactly lightweight. If you remember the joke at the beginning, you know, lightweight. Uh, but it's, it, Docker is brilliant. So 
fully featured, highly configurable. Everyone here has probably used Docker. You can download any number of configurations. It can run applications rather than OS level. Um, but the disadvantage is it's actually quite big. It uses a lot of libraries. We tried really hard to fit it onto those little devices, but it was just a little bit too big. The performance starting and stopping containers also, with great power comes great slowness. That's not really the right quote, but um, that's what we find. So on a small device, Docker, unfortunately, didn't work. Right, go straight to the low end. LXC, the original containers. Um, these are lightweight. They basically are just an interface to C groups and to a cheroot. So it, it sets it up for you. It does a few mounts. It, may, it makes sure that the permissions are there in your C groups for all the devices you need. Um, but ba basically, um, it just does the minimum you need. Uh, and again, these, these figures I have up here, 85 meg, that was just when I went to my PC and said install LXC on a clean Debian. And it took yeah, 85 meg, okay, it's a little bit more than we got on there, but it's just an idea. So it's, it's a lot smaller than the requirements for Docker. The disadvantage is if you've ever played with LXC, almost everything is an operating system image. That's why I said it's not a VM because most people use it as a VM. So you have a Debian image, you have an Ubuntu image, you'll have a Red Hat. You want to run a specific flavor, you use LXC. Now, that normally means you've got a lot of files. You've got a whole operating system. So the disadvantages there are you either have to roll your own really efficient operating system or you have to have a lot of space. Now, we're resource constrained and by definition it means we don't have much space. So, we ended up, obviously, choosing LXC because we tried really hard and Docker didn't fit. So, what's actually missing? LXC has a few uh, starting and stopping scripts. It has some informational scripts. The interesting thing is, what's the one utility LXC doesn't have? LXC. If you used LXD, you've got an LXC utility. One, one utility to rule them all. So. We actually wrote a quick little thing, um, which is basically just a wrapper for everything. It's just convenient, so there's nothing, nothing really exciting in that. I'm trying to go through the slides quickly so we can get to the demo, because I think this is what everyone wants to see. All right, so on this little device you're about to see, what do we actually have? So here are the main utilities that are normally associated with LXC. To actually run a container, not worried about creating, not worried about saving and storing and all that sort of stuff, just to run it, you really only need those. That one's just for convenience, so you can see what's running. But you can start, stop, execute. Now there is a difference between starting and executing. Start starts like an operating system. Execute will execute a single application, very much like Docker. Very few people use that in LXC. And they, there's, if you remember, the libraries. We said you need the library as well. So if you add all of that up, it's just over 1.2 megabytes. So when you put it through a squash file, 250 kilobytes. Now these little guys here, their operating system is a gargantuan 32 megabytes. That's the OS. It's a dual boot, so the thing is if one ever corrupts, you can switch to the second partition. So there's 64 meg of our 256 gone. Now, the other thing is, when you update modem firmware, they can be really, really big. So it's got 256 meg of flash, and you think, oh, it's plenty. Well, a good chunk of that is reserved for modem firmware. So we actually don't have a huge amount of space left. So we've just said we don't have a huge amount of space. What about the container size? Because we've got enough resources to put the utilities in. We've got enough resources um, for running the thing. We've got RAM, we've got everything we need. What about the container itself? Well, last time I looked, you could download a 2004 image, 1.8 gig. Not gonna fit. So what can we do to try and minimize the size of the container? 
it may not be obvious at first, but what we can in fact do is we can use the host operating system. So instead of having an operating system in the flash, what we actually do is we mount the currently available operating system. You might think, why do that? Well, we're still separating the processes. But what it does mean is you have all of the utilities, all of the functions available to the host, but in a safe environment. So you can actually have some useful uh, tasks in very, very small container sizes. And it also maintains the security because you're separated with your container from the host operating system. So what directories are the good ones to mount? Well, in our operating system, and this is probably communal to most, bin. Okay, that's where most of your binaries are. Uh, lib, where the libraries are. Yeah, Sbin, system bin. Uh, var run, a lot of processes actually use var run to manage things. Um, user bin and user lib. So we've mounted those six. And with that, you have a functional operating system within the operating system. So your container looks, feels, and smells like a full-blown OS. Now, because they're so small, you've actually now got two options. These very tiny containers, because they're mounting the, the main utilities, you can run it entirely in RAM. You can decompress the container and put it on a RAM drive. The advantage of that is when you close your container and open it up again, it's in exactly the same state as it started the first time. So if you've messed the configuration, to, I don't know what to do, close it down, start it up again. Now that won't work for every case. There are cases where you want to you know, record configurations. So for our customer, for example, they needed to configure their device, they needed persistent configurations. So you can, of course, run it from Flash. So it will actually decompress the root file system into Flash and run it. All right, so it's looking good so far, but here comes the big but. We have a thing called a linker. Now, on our little devices, we run Muscle. It's a nice, compact C library, and it's POSIX compliant and all. It's great. It fits really well with the, the design of a small embedded device. But there are a lot of people who don't use Muscle. Um, what do we do there? So how do we mount the operating system and still uh, let these people run? Well, not too many people actually. In fact, hands up who knew you can run the linker manually? Ah, good, yep. So what this means is this is a program, the linker, LD, which has no dependencies. It's statically linked. It can run anywhere. But its job is to actually link all the libraries of your application. So if I run this manually, that's the, the muscle linker from that device, you can see it comes up, gives you usage, you can do things. And what you can actually do is you can run a, an application by invoking the linker manually. Meaning that if you have a device with a different linker, so say the standard GNU C or you know, pick your favorite on glibc, um, you can actually run that linker from the container, still have access to all of the muscle utilities, but run your code. The problem here is, of course, libraries. Because, of course, muscle has muscle libraries, glibc has glibc libraries, etc. But that's no, that's no problem. You can actually tell the linker where to find them. And what's more, in a normal PC, if you wanted to find out what libraries were available or were used in, an, in a binary, you'd use LDD. A lot of small devices that especially use BusyBox don't have an LDD. You can still use the LD, the linker, to find out what's there, minus minus list. And it'll tell you which libraries it's using. You can set LD library path, however, if you do that, all of the muscle libraries will now try and use your libraries. So 
Is there another way? Well, yes, there is a parameter to linker to actually set the library path for that invocation. You can, of course, do it on a command line once, but it's easier to, to actually do it from the command line. All right, hopefully I got through that quickly enough. What's the time? Ah, plenty of time. All right, demo time. Um, I will try. Actually, it's going to be easier to... Now I've got to try and move this. Oh. Now, is that too small? Can everyone read that or is that... Actually, probably not. Hmm? Yeah. Actually, it would be nice. Oh, silly mouth. I should really put it on this screen. That's it. I'll mirror the displays instead. All right. Okay. So everyone can see that one. I don't know what's going on there. Okay. So, this is a shell on my PC. And I've actually got, you're welcome to come up and have a look later. I've got a, a slightly bigger brother of this connected in, same processor. So, can ping it. It, work, it helps if I plug the network cable in. There it is. Oh. It's not being very... I was doing this just before. Oh, actually, this is called user error. All right. <laughs> 210, 120, I can't count. All right, so what we can do is. Um, I've enabled the shell on this device. Actually, can I just put that down? Can everyone still hear me if I talk like this? Ah, oh, good. Because now two, I can't type one-handed. All right, so if we go into, I've got my SSH keys in. So this is a shell on the raw device. So for example, if I go to etc. okay, we've got lots of stuff. I can say, say echo, hello, greater than the world. And it comes back saying read-only file system. No good. All right, so how do we invoke the container? We have a little script called LXC, and it's just a wrapper. So if you type LXC, it says, oh, test LXC, not there. Now, if we have a look, uh, CD to opt, LXC. The size of this container is a whopping 359 bytes. Okay. What's it got in there? Oops. Uh, oops. TGZ. It's basically just got the profile, a group, and um, password file. That's just so that when you do an LS, it gives you a nice name. So, how do we invoke it? Boom. We're in. We're in the container. Now, what I did was, it, well, because I actually confused myself a few times, started doing things and found out I was in the container instead of the, the host, so the prompt is LXC. So if we do our same thing as we had before, our etc. hopefully looks different, we can then say echo, hello. 
and it's there because we're now inside the container. We've now got a read-write host-like operating system and we're running on the device. We can do whatever we want. We can create our own files um, and we can basically run them from here. So let's have a look. Um, now I created the world's most complicated, I mean I spent years and years writing this. Hello world. Okay, great. Now, I know that this device runs muscle. I know that it's, it's an ARM32, so I'm going to go around and say ARM32 GCC test.c and I'm going to be good and actually call it not a.out. I've just compiled my amazing program. Now, let's, let's copy it across there. Now remember, this is a full-blown copy of the operating system running on the device. So we've got a few utilities. So let's just do something a bit different. Python 3 minus M. So I'm going to run a, on my PC, I'll run a little web server. And again, with my 359 byte container, Three hundred and fifty-nine bytes, and I've got wget. Or I could have used curl, or I could have used scp, I could have used anything. So I've now got test. Now you may notice because I use wget, no execution rights. Mod. But world is saved. My application runs, compiled from my PC, running in my container. Now, okay, fair enough, I could have got the build environment, I could have created my own application. That's not really very impressive, I think. So, what I did, again, this is a little bit, hopefully, well, I'll explain what goes on. The last time when I made it bigger, we got terrible problem. I downloaded a Raspberry Pi image. Now, I did have to know that it was an ARM32 hard float, so it's the right architecture, but this is Raspberry Pi, it's a stock standard Raspberry Pi. So we could, for example, inside there, go to etc, we can cat issue, and it's, it's a Debian 11 Raspbian image. Now, I've got the most amazing application I've ever seen, and it's written for the Raspberry Pi, it's compiled for Raspbian. I mean, you guys probably never heard of it, it's called LS, it's brilliant, you can see stuff in directories. I want to run that on this device. Not compiled for the same operating system, not even the right linker. So how do we do that? So here's our ls, ls. Okay, so ls exists there. We'll do our same trick, just easy. So we'll go back. So inside, well in fact, I did, what I didn't show you, sorry, is, do you remember we, we echoed hello to world and etc. Well this is an in RAM container. So if we go to etc, it's gone. If I want to run persistently, minus P. So we now have a persistent container which quite luckily has a demo directory. So we actually have a few things pre-done. But what I can do now is I say wget 1682210.2. I've now copied across the Raspberry Pi version of LS. Now we already know wget doesn't give the execution rights, so oh, what happens? Okay, let's have a look. If I run LS now from Raspbian, it comes up says not found. Why is that? because it's using the wrong linker. Now to save time, I've actually copied across the linker from the Raspbian image, and it's the LD Linux ARM hard float. So what I can do is I can say LD Linux, and maybe, maybe even say list um, dot slash ls. Oh, I'm missing a few libraries. 
And again, to save a little bit of time, I've got PyLibs. These happen to be all the libraries that LS uses. So if you remember, I said you can, oops, LD, you say library path. I'll put it as demo slash PyLibs. Run this version of LS. Boom. We're running a Raspbian compiled program in a container on a different system, never compiled for. So this can be your own code. Obviously, LS is a silly example. Uh, and just to prove that's a standard thing, if I was to use the inbuilt one, this is BusyBox, very different version. Just to show you, it is a different version of LS. But basically, you can take your own application and create, uh, a, a, create a, a container to run different things. Now, normally what you'd do is you'd have a complete operating system, you'd have complete libraries, you'd have uh, all the binaries and utilities you needed. That's really big. We've done this in 359 bytes plus the libraries. Now, of course, you can go one step further. You could create yourself a little script so, if, say, ls pi, yeah. oh, this is what happens when you go too large. Um, okay. So, we'll do hash bang bin shell, and we can say ld slash what's it called. Linux um, HFSO3. Linux um, HFSO.3 library path demo pi. I think I called it up by libs. A pi libs. <coughs> and we can say uh, slash demo slash ls. Linux arm um, HFSO3. Did I miss a? So I'm just, sorry, I'm just going to make this a bit small so I can see what I'm doing. Um, LS pi. Oh, hi, for, oh, yes. Thank you very much. Is there people watching? <laughs> okay, so I've now created a little shell script, a little wrapper. Now, for example, one of our customers actually wanted to run a full-blown Java environment, and we just managed to squeeze it into the Flash. It ended up being about 100 meg, uh, but that was a full compiler and... Um, yeah, full compiler and runtime environment. And basically, Java uses a lot of the system utilities, I mean, more than you'd ever imagine. Um, so we could use the native operating system for that. And we wrapped all of the Java executables in scripts just like that. So we managed to actually import it. And I actually think I got it from Alpine Linux. So I just, I basically just took the Alpine Linux Java environment package and just ran it. So you can actually run pretty heavyweight things that normally take a whole operating system on something like this that again is probably the same power as your TV remote control. All you've got to do is follow the rules and that is to one, use the host operating system and two, use the linker. Yeah. So that ends my talk. I've got a, it's not really full, but if you want, the operating system DAO is on GitHub. Um, the only parts that aren't in there are proprietary code that we are not allowed to share with them because of an NDA. Um, and if you want www.digi.com, there's more information about how to run containers on the device.
Any questions? Oh, yeah, that's right. <laughs> Because the hardware guys really get annoyed when you spend two cents more, and I'm not joking. They they almost had a they almost had heart attack when we said, oh, we wanted to go to five twelve. That'll cost you eight bucks. But yeah, so and the, the other thing is those chips come normally. They can go a system on chip or a system on module, and they normally come in set uh, sizes. So yes, you could you could ship more, and we do have bigger devices. We do have quad core devices with you know, 8 gig of EMMC and things like that, and half a gig of RAM. And those things, I mean, I don't know if anyone knows a thing called Ignition Edge. It's actually a, a um, web service running under Tomcat, which is why we have to port Java. And that thing runs on a device that, again, is, is not as powerful as a Raspberry Pi. I mean, nowhere near as powerful as a Raspberry Pi. And so we've got a full-blown Tomcat server running under a container Yep, I've been told lunch. I don't want to get in between you, right, lunch. So if there are no more questions. <laughs>